Why do resistors get hot? Let's start with a battery and two metal plates. You recall a battery has a positive terminal and a negative terminal. The longer plate being the positive, sometimes indicated by the plus. When we connected the battery to the metal plates, an electric field was established between them. And we see that here in yellow with the arrows pointing down. Let's not forget that this is in a vacuum. There is nothing between the metal plates. So we can now add our simple test charge. So let's add a proton with a positive charge. And that proton will accelerate towards the negative plate. If it helps, you could think of the positive plate, the top plate, as having a bunch of positive charge and the lower plate as having a bunch of negative charge. Like charges repel, unlike charges attract. So our positive test charge here will be accelerated towards the negative plate. We could replace our test charge with an electron, which changes the sign to negative, so now the electron will be accelerated upwards towards the positive plate. Bear with me, folks. I'm going to talk about a technology that might seem completely out of place, but it will help us understand what we mean by these electric fields and how the test charges move. Let's talk about the vacuum tube. Now a vacuum tube will have a few parts. It'll have an anode and a cathode. The anode is sometimes called the plate, and the cathode could be thought of as the electron emitter. The final part is located inside the cathode, and that's called the heater. Here's a picture of a vacuum tube. I wanted to say thank you to Scavenger who posted it to Wikipedia. On this picture, you can see the plate. That's the large black part here. The part you can't see is the heater, but you can see what the heater is doing. It's heating the cathode to red hot. This comet is completely off topic, but if you look inside these little circular windows, you can see some very fine lines, and those are called control grids, and they allow a small voltage to control the amount of electrons that are flowing from the cathode to the plate. But that's for another video. Back to our model. When we connected the vacuum tube up to a battery, an electric field was established between the plate and the cathode. Here the electric field is again pointing down. Any electron that finds its way between the cathode and anode will be accelerated up to the anode. And in a vacuum tube, that happens all the time because we have the heater which is heating the cathode up to red hot and those electrons are literally boiling away so a whole bunch of electrons are being accelerated up towards the plate. I'm going to turn this picture upside down and go over an analogy that might help you understand. Here we have Alice. In Alice's hand is a ball. That ball has potential energy. When Alice releases the ball, the potential energy is turned into kinetic energy. And one minutia before the ball strikes the ground, all of the potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy. When the ball strikes the ground, the kinetic energy is turned into heat. Returning to our vacuum tube model, we see that the situation is the same. The electrons, when they start out at the cathode, have potential energy. As the electrons transition from the cathode to the anode, that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. When the electrons strike the anode, the kinetic energy is turned into heat. And so the plate gets hot. A natural question is, how hot does it get? Calculation is very simple. We could say that the power dissipated is the voltage times the current. In a previous video, I talked about voltage being defined as energy per particle. And as you see in these models, that's not a big stretch. When Alice is holding the ball, we could talk about the ball having a certain amount of potential energy. This would be potential energy per ball. Likewise, in the vacuum tube model, that electron, when it sits on the cathode, has potential. So it's potential per charge. Current was defined as the number of particles transitioning per unit time. And if you put those two together, you get the amount of energy, or the amount of work done, per unit time. And if we wanted, we could add some instrumentation. Here we add a voltmeter, so we can measure the electric field across the vacuum tube. And here we add an amp meter to measure the amount of current that flows. 
At this point, we have a good idea how an electron will behave in a vacuum in the presence of an electric field. Let's make things a little more interesting and see how electrons behave in a crystal structure. In this crystal, we see there's a bunch of atoms, and you can think of each atom connected to every other atom via a spring. And these atoms are always vibrating. You could say that this jostling about is temperature. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it in a moment. To this crystalline structure, we're now going to add some electrons. And for convenience, let's just assume that there's one electron in the outermost shell. As in the previous models, we're now going to add metal plates to the top and bottom of this crystal, and we'll connect the entire assembly up to a battery. Now, as soon as we do that, an electric field will be established across the crystal. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The electrons in this model will behave exactly as they did before. So every electron in this crystal, or if you prefer, every electron in this resistor, is going to be accelerated upwards except they're no longer in a vacuum. This time, as they start moving, chances are they're going to strike one of the atoms in the crystal. So now, yes, they had potential energy. The potential energy was converted to kinetic energy. And as soon as they struck one of those atoms, the kinetic energy is converted into heat for the atom that it struck, which is a nice way of saying that the atom that was struck will move you could think of it bouncing in those little spring assemblies a little bit more than it used to. Its temperature has increased. Through this entire video, we've assumed electron flow. The electrons originated from the negative terminal of the battery, passed through the resistor, converted electrical energy into heat, and then returned on the positive terminal of the battery. Please don't confuse this with the model of conventional flow, in which case the particle that flows originates from the positive terminal of the battery, goes through the resistor, and returns to the negative terminal. At this point, you might be asking yourself which model is correct. And the answer is yes, both models are correct. It's a matter of culture. It's a matter of community. The most important thing you can do is just be consistent in your definition of current flow.